Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Addictive Show. We have on with us today author John Dislin. John is the author of this great book, Nehemiah Strong. We will be talking about this book and how you can purchase this book and help support John's ministry here in a little bit. But, uh, John, let's get to a conversation that we were just having. For people who don't know, um, John and I will sit on the pre-brief before we start the interview for almost an hour or two hours, and it'll be the best topics that nobody has ever heard. And then we'll say, we probably should start recording. And you get almost the worst part of the of the interview because all the cool <laughs> stuff's been said. So let's talk about, we were talking about um, logos and designs and why John went with this logo on his book, Nehemiah Strong, and why I went with this logo uh, behind me. And uh, we were talking about going to God for a, a new representation of what it is that we're doing. And uh, John, where were you? What were you saying? Well, uh, I, I'd said before, you know, it's it, it's funny what we'll do in our strength and our will and our plan, and then what God will have for us. He's all his plan is always better, right? Not one hundred percent of the time his plan is better. And in fact, one of my uh, most beloved brothers in Christ, Magnum, and Magnum, I hope you hear this sometime. A uh, shout out to you, my Aussie Spec Ops brother, Magnum. Uh, gave me this this plaque behind me and it, it's proverbs 16 9 and it says a man's heart plans his path but the lord directs his steps and so that's right in keeping with you know we, we might even have a good plan but but god always has a better plan and so i had designed this really campy uh <laughs> this nehemiah strong cover that you know looks like a, a junior high uh book of nehemiah sunday school workbook and and a month or two after that, it just kind of gelled in my spirit about that Nehemiah strong cover with the flaming line of Judah head. Um, and, you know, gave me a better cover, which I'm so thankful for because I, I look at my cover all the time. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so glad I'm not looking at a campy junior high, you know, Sunday school workbook. Uh, but I get to look at the flaming line of Judah head. Right. But uh, anyway, you, Doug, you and I were talking about, you know, logos and your logo and, you know, asking for a better logo. And, and you had said that that logo on your hat, that, that cross of Calvary is a, uh, is a new logo for you, which is a lovely spirit. I was simply going to make the observation, Doug, that uh, in recent months, I've been convicted about not leaving the cross behind, but having greater focus and greater emphasis on what I think might might be an even more powerful logo, and certainly a logo of hope, of vindication, of uh, salvation, et cetera, is not the cross, but the empty tomb. And you know, I think I think it's it's lovely and it's it's uh, appropriate to be mindful of the sacrifice, but to incorporate more of, you know, where the sacrifice was going, and that's the empty tomb, which for us means, you know, confirmation that the sacrifice was not in vain. Like it, th there actually is redemption, there is resurrection, and his resurrection power for his son gets uh, imputed for, you know, our resurrection power for us out of our death and sin to, you know, come out and be born again and to, you know, live in his power. Um, once we come to a knowledge of the truth and receive it and are saved. So that, that, that image, in fact, I've thought about how to, how could you craft a simple yet compelling image of that empty tomb and ruminate on that? Because I was talking yesterday with another gentleman and, and really since then have been convicted about something, which is, you know, salvation is awesome. <laughs> And and obviously, you know, sharing the gospel, as it says at the end of Matthew, is imperative. It's an imperative for believers that you you know what's nice about sharing the gospel is it's not like you lose it when you share it. You share it, and now two people have it, right? But I would add that in addition to being gospel sharing believers, we also should live and walk in an empty tomb sort of. Uh, spirit where we embrace the not only the the salvation piece of it, but the 
charged, empowered ambassadors of Christ piece of it saying, you know, what am I going to do now? I, I don't just sit at the bus stop and, you know, wait to either finish out this run or get raptured out of here or whatever. I've got work to do. And in the hours that remain as these last grains of sand pass through the hourglass, we need to be busy about our father's work, um, doing those works that he's laid up for us from before the laying of the foundation of the world in this moment, because, you know, we're, th this moment is pivotal and it's counting on people like us who are switched on, understand the nature of the times, you know, recognize the evil, you know, to stand up, to step out and to be fearless and to, uh, to storm the gates of hell, basically. You know, I think there's many representations of salvation. Um, the reason why I chose this hat, I was looking for, cause I'm trying to trying to find a, what I think is a good hat to wear, um, for putting a logo on. And, you know, I don't want a bunch of gobbly goop all over my face and my head and my clothes, anything that I do, I want it to be short to the point, um, and, and let, let the words speak for themselves or the image speak for itself. And the, the cross, the white cross in a, in a black hat, the light and the darkness, you know, it's for me, it's, uh, my redeemer symbolizes with me hope, hope, which was something that I didn't have much of before mm. I came a Christian. And then I found an abundance of as I, I fell in love with the father and the son, as I became a member of the family, I learned that hope was a very powerful tool. And to be an image of hope is also such a powerful weapon. And that's why God kind of has put it on my heart, me being the history nerd and all, um, to talk about the failings of faith, trying to get men and women to pick up the shield and sword and join me in the phalanx. Or are you just going to hang out at the bleachers and watch us fight? Or are you going to hang out on your on your recliner and watch the pay per view fight as your brothers and sisters are martyred? You know where are you in the fight? And it doesn't matter who you are in the fight. Are you the the guy with the double handed axe? Are you a shield brother? Are you a, a sword bearer? Are you an archer, a slinger, heavy cavalry? Doesn't matter. Just show up for the fight. That's all Christ wants. Just show up for the fight. And what they don't want, as God has said he hates, is a bunch of cowards and then proclaiming to be Christians. So with a lot of the braggadocious nature of the three-piece suit reverends and pastors driving around in their Lexus and Mercedes, I was given a word from God um, to go down to the trenches where the dead men are and see how many I can save, because that's where I was, and that's where God found me. So, you know... God puts it on your heart specifically what the image of redemption looks like and what John Disling can do to reach the people who are going to be like you, empathetic to you, sympathetic to you. And that's, that is your area of operations. My area of operations is these groups of people. God told me to go after the young men. And, you know, then you have our generational fathers who have you know, captured the hearts and minds of millions of people around the world, like uh, Pastor David Wilkerson, um, probably one of the biggest wow. uh, enigmatic people in my life was a little unknown pastor from, you know, New York, New York. And I think, I think with the direction that we're going, the vileness of the world, we need to have and this is just me speaking upon what God has commissioned me to do. We need to have men to find bravery and courage again. And we need to have men who've been there, done that before to stand up and say, look, you don't, you, you don't have to be special forces operator, Navy SEAL, Ranger certified snipers over here. You can be a proud, bold man. Uh, uh, a couple brothers and I have been talking and, um, you know, everyone says, Hey, dude, what you did in your past was awesome. You know, cause like, we were at the active shooter training. I just recently put on in Tennessee, like, man, you know, I wish I learned all this stuff that you knew. 
I said, well, I mean, I wish I knew what you knew how to do. I don't own a multi-million dollar construction business. I, you should see Doug framing. Okay. It's more like Doug just <laughs> nailing stuff together. Okay. <laughs> I wish my carpentry skills were better. I'm a better welder than a carpenter. Um, but you know, it, it takes a tribe to make the colony survive. All right. The, the gunfighter that everyone proclaims that they want to be until they're, they're in it. Um, that's a 1% crowd. Like I can't do nothing if you can't bring me the bullets that I'm out of. And if I don't get fed and I don't get water and I don't get a place to sleep, well, I'm worthless to you. Okay. And ergo, if you can't stand guard and preach the word, what good are you at bringing hope to the people? If you're so busy watching your back for the, for the fiery darts coming in there. And that's why I'm saying it takes a tribe. We got to have doctors. We got to have lawyers. We got to have the scribes. We got to have the vets. We got to have, um, you know, the animal husbandry people, people building roads and infrastructure. If not, the whole thing collapses. So when I see people and they encapsulate themselves as in my knowledge alone will save you and will rewrite salvation in your mind. I'm like, bullshit. That's you're not Jesus. Though you write yourself to be one, though you have followers who have forgotten their first love and now follow you, you're not the salvation. And so you see men, especially in our movement, John, who have turned themselves into little mini lords. Yeah. And it, if you dare come against them, if you dare speak out against them, if you dare call them out, if you dare upset the apple cart and take away the cash flow, ooh, does the body of Christ crumble in on itself? We we cannibalize ourselves instantly. And that is something that God's put on my heart um, because, for one thing, I don't get friendship pay. I'm not here to make friends. Much like some of the old school prophets. I'm probably not going to be very welcomed, and I'm okay with that. I'm not here to be welcomed. I am here to give the word that God gave me. Dude, if I wanted to you know, go do something else, I can easily go do something else and make a lot of money, but that's not what I'm here for. And that's why God has sustained me, as you know, John, miraculously, beyond Doug's capability of being sustained by himself, God steps in and says, don't worry, son, I got it. Right there on the edge of my seat, God showed how he's always faithful. And for me, this one little simple symbol, okay, the light and the darkness. We talk about child trafficking. We talk about the satanic rituals that are going on. Um, Our brother, Russ Dizdar, God rest his soul, um, the Black Awakening. I've been talking about it, and today will be the first day where I'm actually going to start recording audibly this book and putting it out completely for free on my YouTube page because you can't find this book anymore. We looked on eBay and one of them was for like almost $600 for the Black Awakening. So for those of you who can't buy the book, I'm going to record it so that people can listen to it because I I believe this book is more important right now than many of the other things that are happening because it will open your eyes to what's really going on in the supernatural realm that you operate in every day. And once again, being that, that light in the darkness, um, John, you know, being able to show people, Hey, the tomb's empty, by the way, did you Romans see that? You know, can you believe when the apostles walk by and you have those three, the three Roman soldiers sitting there going, where's he at? Where's he at? They stole his body and they walk by. No one stole his body, kid. He's gone. Like, could you imagine the shock? I know, I know Doug's been a private before. I would not want to go report to my superiors that I just lost the most important man in the world because I fell asleep because a angel came and visited, right? Because who's yeah. going to believe that? You know, I mean, it's, it's to me, it's a hilarious story when you look at it from the military standpoint. If any of you guys were ever in the military listening, like if you fell asleep on post, you are going to have your legs broke. Like your superiors are going to beat you until you understand what staying awake means. So I can only imagine what, what happened to those three soldiers, but, um, the empty tomb, you know, I, 
the cross on Calvary meant a lot to me. I never wanted to wear a cross pendant necklace. I don't know why. Um, a lot of people see I wear a um, an axe necklace, and that's something that just comes from my people, uh, you know, back in Norway, and it's a a remembrance of. For me, it's a remembrance of bravery of what people can do. Now, an axe doesn't mean pagan. It doesn't mean Norse or anything. You know, I mean, it for me, it's it's a simple remembrance of bravery and how at some point in time, you just got to pick up the axe and swing. You can't talk anymore. You know, so that's what's one of the reasons why I wear it as just, a, you know, uh, every now and then I'll just sit there and I'll, I'll, I'll touch it and I'll just remember how many hundreds of thousands of people have fought and died in this world and they did it for what causes, for what reasons, and what am I fighting for and what am I willing to die for? And so I wear that as, as you know, my heart on my sleeve, I wear that on my chest, um, kind of like keeping me in check. But I wear this hat because I have had so many good, positive interactions with just random people who go, hey, man, I like that hat. Hey, brother, thanks, man. Jesus loves you. That's that's your chance. Bam, stab the enemy right in the back. Hey, Jesus loves you, by the way. You know, so that's that's one of the reasons why I like to love it. I, I love to wear it. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and yeah, I, I love how you segue there. And I'd like to I'd like to sharpen iron over that for the young men that that follow you, Doug, because um, because I've got a heart for them too. You know, I was uh blessed with a couple of daughters that mean the world to me, and they're just they're so wonderful and gorgeous and you know i'm so proud of them but uh you know I, i've got a heart for young men i never really got to to exercise it in terms of having boys of my own so so maybe i can do a little bit of that here with you and the young men who follow you but um i'd like for us to dig in on that a little bit because i remember you know as a young man and i would and, and i grew up going to church going to sunday school whatever so i think some of the young men who follow you probably did. I, I'm sure a lot of them didn't or had had bad experiences. But when you talk about Jesus, okay, the name that shall not be uttered, <laughs> let's let's talk about Jesus and let's talk about the the big con that the world presents around him that makes everybody so uncomfortable to talk about him. Okay. And and gives would give a lot of young men such a wrong perspective about who he was really and what he represented and what he did for uh, all of us. You know, a, a man is as big and powerful as Doug, you know, basically brought to his knees, you know, because he knows he's so in need of salvation. So, so, you know, the world, Doug, I think, well, I'll ask you this question before you were saved before you know, you laid it all at the foot of the cross and you repented and believed, which is the, the essence of salvation, right? If you want to be saved, you fall to your knees, you repent of, of your wicked ways because you're all wretched. We are all wretched. And you turn it over to Jesus and you make him your Lord and also your Savior. You don't get the Savior peace without the Lordship, okay? Which is a mistake I made for about 30 years. Um, Doug, what, before you were saved, you know, as a younger man, when you thought about Jesus, you heard people talk about Jesus, whatever, what were some of those misconceptions or misperceptions that now looking back as an older, wiser man, you can recognize that the well, world sort of imputes into society, into culture, into young men? Well, down in Southeast Texas, we have little bitty churches everywhere. Um and it's it's primarily Baptist and Pentecostal, and um, I walk through the the doorways of a few Baptist church here and there. Surprisingly, my feet didn't catch on fire, like I was told that that would happen. Uh, Pentecostal lady said that oh, you come in here and your feet will catch on fire. Okay, um, <laughs> the Christian superstition really rubbed me the wrong way. Where you gotta, it, it, it's everything's rituals and rites, and and I'm like, there's got to be more to to Christ than just that. Yeah. Um. The weakness of the men around me appalled me, and yeah. most of the strong men that I grew up knowing, unfortunately, remember, 
this is my personal experience. Most of the strongmen that I grew up knowing, uh, knowing were they believed in God. They claimed to be Christians. They were hardcore alcoholics. They were Masons, uh, veterans, oil field workers, and they never went to church except for what Easter and Christmas, right? The old Americanized uh, religion. And so I didn't think much of it. It was never a opportunity or option for me growing up. Um, I had cousins who dabbled in Norse Viking paganism. And so then I did, and I discovered, uh, Viking paganism in high school and then got into the wrong crowd of people in the Marine Corps who really believed in Viking paganism. And what I found out later as a smarter adult and not a stupid young man mm. was that it's all braggadocious. It's all ego. And I, I laughed about the same thing when I was sitting, um, as a prison guard working for the federal bureau of prisons for the department of justice. And I would see the white supremacists over here and they'd all have their mule nears. Um, you know, they, they'd have all their Viking tattoos and it's all for one thing. I was a tattoo artist a long time ago. I don't talk about it. Um, but the, the artwork on them was garbage. Um, I, I am historically based, not fad based though. Originally you could say I got into it because I was looking for strength. I was looking for inspiration. We were going yep. to war and people were, you know, hey, cry Odin as you go into war. That was a new thing within the military. And looking back, the spirit of that that has so greatly infected not just the military, but law enforcement. You'll see um Thor and you'll see Odin and you'll see Loki. And, and they're all over. And I was like, man, what happened to Christ? Now, as a Christian, I can look back and say that. But as a young man, it's all power and brutality and strength and looking cool. And it's a bunch of empty promises. Because it never brought me anything. Yeah. It never brought me anything. I mean, you know, the strength that I had came from me. And I thought wearing the hammer around my, my neck looked cool. And it made me powerful, but just like every pagan religion, there's nothing in it. Yeah. You get what mo momentary, um, temporary things here and there, um, a little adrenaline rush here and there. But other than that, you know, um, it was nothing to me, but I, I was very much into the history of everything. So I got too, I was too much of Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole on that one much like our flat earther friends. Um, <laughs> they're going to beat me up in the comment section. Here you go. Um, but <laughs> you know, for me looking back as a young, uh, uh, as an, you know, an adult looking at a young man, I see that I didn't have strong Christians around me who spoke up, who spoke out, who would take leadership. Um, they were content with being quiet. They were passive. Um, and if anything, it was always, oh, that guy. And I don't know what it was. And this is, this is my, not my ego talking now. That was my ego talking then was, oh yeah, it was that guy. Yeah. Let's, let's count on the benevolence uh, of the guy over there praying. But you know, what's funny is before every single one of our patrols that we would go on atheist pagans and Christians alike. Do you know what everybody did? Do you know what everybody did? Everybody got into a group circle and prayed every single time. And guess who we prayed to God every single time blew my mind, blew my mind. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm over here saying, I don't believe in any of this and I don't care anymore, but Hey, you know what? Everyone's praying to God. So it sounds like a really good idea. Um, <laughs> and, and I was like, I was just, I was blown away with that mindset. Um, but you know, once again, what, where did it get me? It got me nowhere. It was false. It was absolutely false. Um, much like many of the, you know, modernized Christian religions that we have right now, you know, you, you have what you think is a worship of Christ, but what you worship is a man's doctrine and ideology of what they view worship should be like. And that's why I find religions within themselves as a whole to be very dangerous and cult-like. 
Uh, and I mean, broad spectrum, you can hate me all you want. They've all become cult-like because are we not the body? Are we not his hands and feet? Or is it, no, we are the body, but on the left hand, you have the Baptist, the Pentecostal, the Lutheran, the Methodist, the Catholics, and over here, you got the, you know, whatever, 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 whatever. That's not the body of Christ. That is the body divided. Yep. Mm. I, um, you know, when I think back on my childhood, you said some things that really echo with me. And of course, we we had different kinds of experiences, grew up in East Tennessee and, you know, not, not around the oil fields, didn't have so much of the, the alcoholist, alcohol, uh, alcoholic effect, didn't have so much of the, 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 uh, the Freemason effects in my immediate circle. What I did have was, um, a depiction, a characterization of a weak Christ of a, mm, I wouldn't say humble because he was humble, but, but a, a, an impotent Christ, that might be the better word. Okay. Yes. And as a young man, and I was trying to find my way in the world and trying to figure out, you know, what does it look like to be a man? And I actually had my, my dad's 90th birthday was yesterday. And so, uh, happy birthday to my dad who probably won't hear this, but, (laughs) uh, but you know, through him had a lot of lovely characteristics of what a real man was, but of course, as a, as an egotistical young man thinking I knew everything, right. you know, I was I was quick to reject that and and quick to to look for, you know, other role models, and I, I'd love it, Doug, if if you and I spent a few minutes sharpening iron around around the real Jesus, not the caricature, oh, yeah. caricatured Jesus. Okay, yeah, because the th- as an old man now. And it's funny I'm saying that because, you know, in my mind, in a lot of respects, I still feel like a young man, although I recognize I've got the years on me. But as I look at the works of Christ, the speech of Christ, the boldness of Christ, the the fearlessness of that Lion of Judah, that Lion of Judah, the flaming Lion of Judah on that book cover behind you, that's who he has always been. He humbled himself for us. Like he, he left the throne room of God, the right hand of the Lord God Almighty, the Father, came down here for us. It was a suicide mission. He was, he was not getting out alive, and he knew it when he obediently came from the throne room of God to, to become embodied as a man, so fully God and fully man. Yes, it's a mystery. Yes, you can ask God about it when you meet him. The God <laughs> you know, if you want to wrap your mind around it fully, I think you're going to have to wait till then. But that's as courageous as it gets, right, Doug? I mean, how many of, of you and your compadres volunteered for a certain suicide mission? Well, if you, nobody. if you look back in military history, anyone who was put on a legitimate suicide mission And I don't mean like kamikazes. Um, That's men who are scared and who believe a false ideology. No, a suicide mission is saying, look, I, the bomb has to blow and I have to push the button and I'm the senior man. So get you and the boys and get the hell out of here. You got three minutes. Love you. If you have the bravery to do that, that is what Christ talked about. Laying down your life for your brother. I believe that is what Philadelphia means, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Because what parent wouldn't do that for their child? As the father wouldn't do that for us? Absolutely. He did it. He did it. And, you know, I've actually gone to looking back into the old Testament to find Jesus more than the new Testament. And I believe here, here's a, here's a new way to study your Bible is that in the new Testament, we learn of the compassion of Jesus and we learn this is the lamb, but in the old Testament, the Lion of Judah was there first. He was already there. 
He went from being the most high, the mightiest, our strong tower, our strong defender. I personally believe Elijah called down fire from the sky and it was Jesus who turned the knob on. Oh yeah. Lava from the sky. Got it. <laughs> my, no prophet problem. Wa- my prophet wants it. My prophet gets it. He asks, he shall receive flume lava from the sky. Right? So I personally believe that was Jesus who went forth and who was that, that pillar, that cloud in the sky protecting um, the Israelites from the Egyptians. I I personally believe it was Christ who led us from the beginning and who will guide us all the way to the end because he never left us. He was always with us. If he's not with us physically, he was there in spirit and the Holy Spirit is with you now. So that's my new way of looking at it because yes, growing up, I thought that Christ was weak and impotent. Um, He was all about love. He would turn the other cheek just to get slapped again. No, do your history. Do you know what that means? In the old Greco culture, which is Greek, in the old Grecian culture, the old Roman culture, to turn the other cheek, if you get struck, okay, you remember the old movies where you'd have two knights and one guy take his glove off and slap the other guy in the face, (laughs) right? It was always comical. And that was a, I challenge you to a duel. Where do you think they got that custom from? Bam, you hit me. Turn the other cheek means, okay, hit me again. I dare you. You really want this? Strike me again. That is what Jesus was talking about. You limp-wristed Christians out there who who abuse what the master said. That's what he was talking about. And you have to have a level of compassion and a level of justice that goes with it. And only Christ can bring the compassion and the justice to scale equally because men's hearts can't be trusted because we'll go from vileness, too much compassion and empathy, and you look like a wuss, to overaggression and anger, and you become vile, you become a villain. Only Christ can put the temperament in the blade. Only he can. You know, you have to sharpen the iron, but eventually it has to go back into the water and the oil and be quenched or the blade will be brittle and you strike it and it breaks. You have to understand the processes. And if you don't read from Genesis to Revelation, you're not going to understand the process of God constantly putting you into the fire and pulling you out and bashing everything stupid out of you. That's what I used to say. Oh, Doug's got a bunch of stupid left in them. Let me put them back on the <laughs> anvil and throw, thrust them back into the fire. Like I said, um, when I was 30, I was like, man, yes, I'm 30. And in about a couple months, I look back at me being 29. I'm like, man, I was an idiot kid. And then at 31, I look back at me being 30. Man, I was an idiot kid. Up until last year, I'm like, I finally get it. And I'm 36. You know, I'm I'm like, I'm still an idiot kid. Next year, I'll say I'm still an idiot kid. I was going to say, what do you think you're going to do when you're 42 and look back on your 36-year-old self? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well look at this. Look at this stupid kid. Um, now, the things my grandfather said in his 90s make sense. You right. know, it um, self-reflection helps. Um, understanding honor, courage, commitment, virtue. Understanding uh, philosophy helps because... I think, yes, you can read the Bible and you can understand a lot and you can gain a lot of knowledge, but if you become a history student, a scholar of history from that time period, which is one of the reasons why I focus on that time period two to 3,000 years ago, then you get to understand the hearts and minds and psychology of those people and the way they used language which helps to expand and expound upon the way it was wrote in the Bible. For me, that helps me to understand military culture and then the culture of where they got it from within the people. Um, And that to me, that helps me go, okay, well, I know that these groups of people have these customs and cultures. And so when they're doing these little conversations and that translates to over here in the Bible, now I can put a picture in my head. And understand it. That was probably one of my probably one of my biggest problems with reading uh, the New Testament is I couldn't put it 
into such a compassionate um, context. Does that make sense? I couldn't imagine how Jesus could be so loving to these people when when I turn you know back into history, you know, go from Leviticus to Kings and so on and so forth. Um, you know, when you when you read how God keeps saying, Oh, you children, you keep grumbling. Here I am. I took you out of Egypt. I took your fathers across the waters at the Red Sea. I took you through the wilderness. You never died from thirst. You never died from being hungry. I saved you from the enemy and you keep complaining to me. You know, uh, how do you think Jesus was talking to the apostles? But it was a, it, it, God went from the Lion of Judah to compassion. And that compassion, when you understand that Exodus 15, three, okay, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Jesus is a man of war. So for once again, for all you men, you pacifists out there who you don't want to hurt people. I don't want to hurt people either. I don't think anybody that is a, a follower of Christ wants to hurt people. But if you don't understand that God wanted his people to be warriors. The, from the outset, the nation of Israel was a military campaign from the beginning all the way to the point that Christ returns. It is a military campaign. That's how everything is set up. That's the organization of God's government. When I, He is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of champion angels. What, what are we talking about? Where did this impotent Christ come from. It came from false teachers. The pit of hell. And it came from weak men. And I think that's what influenced younger guys like you and I. Yep. And that's why we had a a bad taste of Christ growing up. Because where was the the men on fire for God who knew their history and knew what they were talking about? And they didn't, you know, go to, you know, Sunday school for three months and learn, okay, this is this year's sermons read from the book. I think yeah, that's, that's blasphemous. And and so to, 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 to riff on what you're saying right now, Doug, I would just exhort the young men who, who you young men who follow Doug don't fall for the con that our shared enemy would have you fall for, which is Christ is impotent. Christ, Jesus Christ had to humble himself in order to get himself, well, to to trick Satan and his minions into putting him on the cross to pay the price for us. Because as scripture says, you know, there will be bloodshed in payment for sin. That's just, that's, that's the price. That's God's uh, law. And, and, but the beauty of that is it set up the opportunity for the spotless lamb who was slain, which was a prophetic utterance about Jesus 700 years prior, by the way, pointing to Jesus on the cross. It had to be so for, for us to receive salvation. So if you, if you look at the cross and you look at Jesus as weak, you've got to consider that him him allowing himself to be horrifically uh, assassinated, you know, through a, 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 one of the most, about the most torture, tortuous, torturous uh, forms of murder ever invented. It's diabolical in its design. And when you consider by his own words, Jesus said, if I desired, I could call down more than 12 legions of angels to my aid and they would come. He, every breath he took, he could have made that call. And every breath he took until his last, he did not. And that was the ultimate act of love for you. You know, be careful what you wish for, because if you really want the Lion of Judah God with no spotless lamb who was slain, that line of Judah, God comes and judges you for every sin you ever committed, every every wicked thought you ever had, every every uh, careless second glance at a woman you ever took. 
be careful what you wish for because it's that ultimate sacrifice literally of himself pouring himself out for you that's it doesn't get more courageous and selfless than that and i'm doug i'm moved by you you referenced it a minute ago but jesus himself said uh, greater love hath no man than that he lay down his life for his friends well what do you think jesus did for you he he poured out his life for you while you are still his enemy because you picture him like this weak, milk toast, impotent, uh, hollowed out, quote unquote, Christian man or or image that that you picture Christian men to be. That's not this generation's Christian man men. That not the men I know. Not men like Doug Thornton. Not men like uh, Bob Griswold. Not men like Jamie Walden. Not men like Alex Jones or Steve Quayle. Or, or a ton of these other men, you can be, and Doug, I want your input on this. I, I, I would, I would argue that I would argue that one of the most courageous things that a an up and hard, uh, right minded, powerful man of God can do is to stand in the face of the enemy and be long suffering enough, like Christ to not absolutely, you know, cut down our enemy because we love him enough to to want to give him a chance to choose salvation before his end because we also are mindful that we were the enemy once too. What are your this, thoughts on that? This is very funny that you have been saying what you've been saying not knowing that I'm opened up to 2 Kings chapter 6 <laughs> starting at 15 verse 15 on that's the holy spirit by the way oh dude totally holy spirit knew knew you were while i was while i was spelling words welcome to church with john and doug <laughs> <laughs> when the servant of the man of god rose early in the morning and went out behold an army with horses and chariots was all around the city and the servant says alas my master what shall we do he said do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Amen. All right, listen to this. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. And soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And as soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And guess what? And the Syrians did not come again on raids into, into the land of Israel. That's providence, buddy. I can't believe you said that, and I'm sitting here reading it. Um, but I want to say, <laughs> if if you don't know about the horrors of war for of warfare that happened in the Old Testament, Second Kings, man, is filled with it. Ben Hadad's siege of Samaria was brutal brutal afterward ben hadad king of syria mustered his entire army and went up and besieged samaria and there was a great famine in samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five shekels of silver now as the king of israel was passing by on the wall a woman cried out to him oh you're going to hear a a a brief passage of jesus 
God has, has taught me how to hear Jesus throughout the old scripture. And, and I'll point it out to you if you don't understand it already. Um, a woman cried out to him saying, help me, my Lord, O King. And he said, if the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you from the threshing floor or the wine press? And the king asked her, what is your trouble? Okay. From the threshing floor or the wine press? The king of Israel says, I can't help you. Should I get the bread and wine? Who gave us the bread and wine that helps us? Who mm-hmm. is the bread and the wine? That's right. So right. I, eat, I've learned eat this bread. This bread is my body. Drink this cup. This cup is my, is my blood poured I, out for you. I swear to you, Jesus is throughout the entire, every single book of the old yes. Testament. Yes. You, you have to know the new Testament to be able to see him in the old Testament. Yes. You know, it's, it's not like Meshach and Abednego and Shadrach. And, Don't and leave Shad, out Shadrach and, and Shadrach. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> I need to keep <laughs> drinking water over here. Um, Shadrach, me, um, say it, John. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you. All right. So, yes, he was in the burning furnace with them, but he's all throughout Scripture, guys. Just you just have to read. That's what I think is probably one of the worst things that Christians don't do is they don't read. Um, well, and Doug, but, if I could just if I could illustrate that, and God says it Himself, okay. I can't I can't quote the uh the book chapter and verse but but in scripture in the old testament it says it is to the glory of god to conceal a thing and the honor of kings is to search a thing out he wants you to be a king and a priest in his kingdom he Absolutely. wants you to search him out and you know Doug 10 years ago you couldn't have seen what you see now in scripture but you've invested time and you've sought God out in his word. And as you have, as you've honored your heavenly father by seeking his face, he has blessed you with an increasing degree of discernment. And I'll tell anybody who's listening, like if it, if you want to get really switched on and understand the supernatural uh, heavenly realm war that's raging. And now we see it spilling into this physical realm. If you, if you don't get that, first of all, you're, you're just got an unlit grid. Like you, you just, you just can't, you can't see authentically to the depth you need to the nature of what's going on in this world around us. But if you want to get switched on, first of all, get on your knees and ask for discernment, Absolutely. but pick up your Bible and start reading it. If you don't have one, go buy one. You can get one for like five bucks. Um, and, uh, and if you want one, you can reach out to me at my website and I will send you a Bible. Okay. Nehemiahstrong.com or John Um, but, uh, if, if you want to really understand what's going on in the world, pick up your Bible and start reading it and your eyes will, your eyes will open. Yeah, man. Uh, It's, it's that simple. It's so simple. The Lord put it in one great, big, beautiful book for us to read. And you, can you believe he even gave us two eyeballs to read it with? So in case one goes bad, just in case God spared us for another. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think the problem of the times right now, and I've been beating this horse until it's nothing more than roadkill. So I'll give it another kick is that (laughs) we are focused on things that we probably, you know, shouldn't be so focused on sports, politics, music, um, you know, our hobbies. And then we have the giants and the demons and the alien deception, all good things, all good things. I understand. I understand. But has it replaced your first love? Do you know more about those topics than you do Christ? You know, Mm. if, if I said, John, we're going to be out in a group of people. I want you to explain to everybody why Nephilim is so important to know, man, I could go to any, any conference out there, any Christian conference, and there'll be 5,000 Steve Quails lined up to tell me everything that he's ever wrote in a book. And that's great. But are you that compassionate to talk to a stranger about Jesus? There's your war. 
Mm-hmm. There's your war. Step well, out. Well, and of there's your yourself. victor, right? There's your there's your path to victory. Is yeah. And, and here's the thing, Doug. I, you know, I think I think in a sense, God gave us men uh, an appetite for understanding our enemy, right? A yep. a, a desire for discernment, a it's, desire for yeah. understanding, gathering, and, and that's a good thing. Like mm-hmm. for example. Understanding the Nephilim helps me understand the power and the import of the of the story of David and Goliath, where David slew a Nephilim. Nobody ever calls him that. He's Goliath, but but Goliath, just the name sounds big, right? I mean, he was nine foot six. He was Lord knows. I mean, a thousand pounds, twelve hundred pounds, gigantic. I'm I'm a giant for humans. And so are you, kind of a different dimensionality, but but we both re- would regard Goliath as an as, as an astounding giant, and yet yet God slew Goliath through David. David is a model of Christ, right? As uh, uh, the the uh, the root of Jesse, right? Is his is his uh, forefather? That's King David, and it was prophesied. That the Messiah would come from the root of Jesse through David, and and that's a picture for us as believers in our lives that we slay giants. We, we're if you're in Christ, or if you want to be switched on, and you you want to have like that superpower strength, you get into the Christ, you will be a giant slayer. Right? Absolutely, that's, that's Absolutely. the promise of God. And so so back to what we were talking about with the Nephilim, Doug. It's important to understand the Nephilim, but only so far as to understand the context of it in the the sense of understanding our enemies and understanding the massive overpowering victory through Christ that's available to us living today. Yeah. To me, to me, that's far more important. I mean, great. Okay. They're Nephilim. Well, how about the one that David cut the head off of? Let, let's let's focus on that and how he was empowered through the Holy Spirit through being switched on with God to be a giant slayer. And, and let's exhort the young men who follow you. Hey, that's a, that's that's not Doug and me talking. We were young men once. We were like you once, and we're exhorting you. We got we got other things we could be doing, but but we feel compelled to exhort you. To plug into that um, power that's available through Jesus Christ, if you will only repent and believe, then you'll be a giant slayer because it'll be God working through you. You know, I mean, when when I think about David, I think of a couple different verses, you know, um, faith of a mustard seed, you know, a mighty man. Um, yeah. Jesus says, do not touch my little ones. Well, David was, you know, barely a teenager. Yeah. You know, and, and if, yeah, you, and by the way, if I could speak to that, Doug, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't help it. Um, no, go ahead. If there are young men who are listening who, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're not a human giant. Maybe you're, you know, five foot nothing, a hundred and nothing. Doesn't matter. Look, look at, again, look at David. It, it's not about your strength in you. It's about, and look, <laughs> God loves to work miraculously through improbable people. Right? God loves an underdog. Oh, and 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 so if 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 you look at yourself and you see yourself through the world's eyes and you think, well, I'm nobody. Well, you are you, friend, I am I'm here to tell you that that God loves, like Doug said, the underdog. He loves uh humbling the proud with the humble. And and so if that's you, brother, I am here to tell you God's got great plans for you if you will only repent and believe and and allow him to work mighty things through you. Truly. Stop looking at yourself the way the world would look at you and see yourself like like I believe it was a Christophany in the Old Testament back to the whole stories about Jesus, right? When Gideon's down in the wine press threshing out the wheat because he's hiding, he's down down below the the ground level hiding from the Midianites, getting a little 
wheat for to make some bread. And it's a Christophany. Christ appears to him and he says, Greetings, O mighty man of valor. Gideon did not was not acting like a mighty man of valor. He didn't feel like a mighty man of valor hiding in the wine press. Okay? He was the he was the lowest man of his tribe. He, well, he was the lowest member of the lowest family of the lowest clan of the lowest tribe of the lowest nation. So you, no matter, I don't care you listening, how small you are, maybe how uh, handicapped you might be, you aren't lower than Gideon, okay? God said to Gideon, and God is no liar, greetings, O mighty man of valor, because he wasn't looking at Gideon through the world's eyes, and he wasn't seeing Gideon for who he was in that moment. He was seeing Gideon for who he was going to be walking in obedience with God and allowing God to strengthen him and to lift him up and to make him a mighty warrior. Okay. That could be you. And I just, I'm exhorting you. Don't care what you look like. Don't care how big you are. If you can, will turn your face to God and humble yourself and pray and you seek his face and you turn from your wicked ways, God's got a story for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, once again, it's actually why I have fallen in love with going back through like first Chronicles and mm -hmm. learning about David and all of his fights. And um my my youngest son, our our newest child, um, he's actually named after David's uh top general, I think like captain general, whatever his title was, uh Abishai. And Abishai the son of Zariah killed 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. <laughs> Excuse me? 18,000 men? A division. Yeah. <laughs> On yeah. his own. Yeah. Go, go tell Chuck Norris, go kill all those people over there. That's pretty much yeah. who we're talking about. Like, I mean, it's, it's incredible when you read. And the inspiration of what these men were able to do because they magnified God, they glorified God, the men would go out and sing the praises and the worship of God before the battle. The Greeks did the same thing. They would actually sing the peon, which was a battle poem that they would march to in the phalanx, which would keep the chest up the lungs open, the throat open so that you could breathe because in the midst of adrenaline, you get tunnel vision and you get scared and you start to collapse in. You wore a lot of gear. I mean, the, the Spartans wore 60 to 80 pounds worth of armor and with a 30 pound shield, the auspice, the shield, um, it was hard sometimes and it was constricting. So they would sing so they could walk and breathe together. You know, there's a psychology behind this. Well, the same thing with the Israelites. They would praise God and put him out in the forefront of the battle. They would, they didn't put themselves in the forefront of the battle. They put God out in the forefront. You know, how many times do you do that in your life? And for all the young men listening, you know, I don't think there is a man alive right now that I could turn to and say, yeah, admire that guy. Certainly not me. Yeah. You know, so I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know who I could turn to. And so I just keep turning back to the Bible. Like there's your admiration. Admire what happened in history. Learn from what happened and also the mistakes of history. Learn from the good things and bad things and develop who God wants you to be. But be willing to step out into the fight. You know, I had a, I had a, a widow woman who's probably in her late seventies told me she's wheelchair bound and she's stuck in an apartment on like the 20th floor. Very sad story. But she said, I want to be in the fight. And I'm just sitting there going, praise God. There's one. Wow. The, I'll take the little old lady who's paralyzed in a wheelchair before I'll take 90% of you soft-handed men who say that you're you and all your your macho-ness i've seen too much of it i've seen too much of the bravado i've seen too much of the macho-ness 
dude, I did 15 years of vi- of professional violence. You're not going to scare me. You're not going to shock me. I'm, I'm not going to be oohed and awed by your manliness because I know one hit to the face crumbles most men and it will crumble every woman, but one hit to the face will crumble most men because they go out and test themselves. And I think that's because the fight's not in them anymore. And if that little old lady asking me, Doug, what can I do to be in the fight? And I oh. said, and I asked her, well, what can you do? You know what she said? I can make the greatest chocolate chip cookies you've ever ate. Perfect. When everything goes bad and we come back from a bad day of patrol, I, I want chocolate chip cookies because it'll raise the spirit. And that's you in the fight. Isn't that right, mm. John? How many times, John, mm. have you and I sat here and talked offline in a way that no one ever heard? And you rebuked me, John. You rebuked me because I was denying people who were sending donations to me because I felt bad about it. What did you tell me? I was denying their ability to be in the fight. Yeah. You know, I yeah, mean, and, and God cool. bless the people who want to be in the fight. I, I'll just to, it's amazing, you know, this, this is a Holy Spirit thing going on, but there's a story I wanted to tell about an invalid, uh, much like this, this lovely woman who said, how can I be in the fight? There, in the 18, late 1800s, there was a, uh, a world-renowned evangelist named D.L. Moody. He went on, I think this is the 1880s, maybe. He went on vacation in England. And, you know, this is the day of sailing ships and all this. So, he, so he's in England for months, weeks, many weeks in the countryside. And uh, one Sunday, they go into the local church. By the way, uh, Doug and, and listeners, this story was told multiple times times I heard it from Russ Dizdar. Okay. So this is where the story comes from. D.L. Moody goes into the local little Anglican church there in the countryside of England. Of course, he's so world renowned as an evangelist that they recognized him. Uh, and you know, this is the, before the age of internet. So, so to be recognizable around the world like that is kind of a big deal. So anyway, they recognize him and the pastor says, oh, you know, Pastor Moody, would you please just say something? And he's on vacation, but, you know, what are you going to say if, if the pastor asked you to speak? So he gets in front of the, the audience and or the, the, the uh, congregation, and he basically shares a, a simplified version of the gospel. You know, what Jesus did for you, he died for you, horrible death, and you're a wretched sinner and didn't have to do it, but he did it because of love. He loves you and and he wants you to come to salvation. And and at the end of this this simple statement of, of the gospel, he said, Now, anyone is there anyone here who would like to receive this free gift, repent and believe, and and be born again? You know, please just raise your hand. And this is the congregation you showed up early for church on a Sunday morning, right? Almost every hand went up. And so then he says, No, no, you know, because there's a little bit of a you know cultural gap between America and, and England. He said, no, put your hands down. And he, he said, you must misunderstand. He very simply laid out the gospel. And he said, if you have never received this, if you want this, you want to repent and believe, you want to get saved, raise your hand. Almost every hand goes up. He's like, Come on down, <laughs> come on forward, and they, you know, prayed a prayer and and got all these people saved, and and in that little season, revival broke out in this community, this little, you know, uh, rural area in England. All of a sudden, hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people, come to this little church, and and they started meeting every day, every night. And it was revival, right? So it's so Holy Spirit just pouring out this place, people bawling and begging for forgiveness and coming to faith and inviting their friends. And, and this goes on for a few weeks. And all of a sudden, D.L. Moody's not on vacation anymore, right? He's working, working, they're, you know, saving souls and sharing the gospel and welcoming people into the family of, of God. A few weeks go by, and all of a sudden, it struck D.L. Moody. And he turns to the pastor and they're, they're working. They're just, you know, preaching the word and, and saving people. Turns to the pastor. He said, who has been praying for this? Who has been praying for this? And the pastor said, follow me. 
and they go into town and they go, you know, in that time in England, you would have a, you would have a, I, I'm not sure what you call it, like a sanitarium. You would, you would have a place where invalids go to die, almost like a hospice. Okay. And so they go into this place and in that place, there's an invalid who is a member of the church, but they're so old and broken. They can't come anymore. And they're, they're lying there in, in the bed dying. And the pastor takes them to the bed of this precious believer who anyone in the world would say, this, this person's worthless, right? We're just warehousing this person to die. They go into this person's area next to their bed on the wall next to the bed of the invalid that the world would say was worthless was a picture of D.L. Moody. And this invalid, this, this worthless person, powerless person prayed, did not just pray for revival in their community. This person prayed for D.L. Moody to bring revival to their community. So back to what I was saying a minute ago, you think you're impotent. You don't, you don't think God has room for you. You don't think power is not available. You think power is not available to you. Think on that story. That's a true story. And, and the, the, the impact that that, you know, the world would discard that person, right? The, the, the Canadian nation would euthanize that person. But, but God says, no, I have a plan for that person in my kingdom. And in and, and the, and the hereafter, when the race is run, that person heard, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and you, you ought to be burning in your spirit right now to want to hear those words too and w- want to join in the family of God and get busy on the battlefield because we're in a war and this society, this age, needs young men like you what do you think let's go hypothetical john what do you think when we have let's say 2024 comes we've lost our country world war three is broke out civil war is very broke likely out. yeah very it's likely. i i unfortunately agree with you how much is is the body of christ going to be needed Uh, I guess I would, I would answer that by pondering a related question. Okay. Uh, in one of his letters and I apologize, I should remember this better, but I think it must, I think it's second Thessalonians chapter two in my defense. I think I might be wrong. Paul writes that the restrainer is translated either restrainer or comforter. But he says the restrainer will restrain until he is taken out of the way. And then there's a comma. And then it says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, the man of sin, the son of perdition, blah, blah, blah. That's the Antichrist. And then all hell breaks loose. So so by inference, (laughs) it's clear that the body of Christ is the salt and the light that sustains and preserves a an even somewhat orderly civilization until it's pulled out and then literally all hell breaks loose. So so I guess that that would be my answer is that the inference by scripture itself and Paul's writings is we're the linchpin that that holds everything together the Holy Spirit through us, right? And when that pin is pulled, I mean, think of it as like a pin on a grenade, Doug. When that pin gets pulled, it's going to be hell on earth. And 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 we, in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, are, are what is sustaining civility in the world. And, and frankly, shoving, you know, and that's what I want to exhort your people to do. I've been exhorting people in different interviews it's time we get really busy and storming the gates of hell. And, and not only storming the gates of hell, Doug, taking these uh, traitors to humanity, these human, you know, demon sacks, and shoving them back in behind the gates of hell. As we storm the gates of hell, the battlefield is ours to take. 
I, I'm utterly convinced of that. And 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 through God's power, His sovereignty, and and the 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 frankly the dominion. This is one of those uncomfortable things they don't teach in Sunday schools, right? The the authority that that Christ Himself gave us believers. I mean, you want to plug into power. Go read all the scriptures. There's a section on it, you know, uh, spiritual authority section in Nehemiah Strong. Go, go, but you don't have to buy the book. Go, go read scripture about uh, spiritual authority held by Christians, and it's it's uh, boundless. Uh, but but that's that's to, so sorry very long way to okay. answer but but that's the degree of impact and import I believe the church the the body of Christ has in this age it's it's uh, it makes all the difference. What do you think? Well, I just I I consider the repercussions of going against God and doing evil on the side of the Lord. First um, Chronicles twenty one. Starting at verse 11. So Gad came to David and said to him, think about this. Think about when worse comes to worse in this country, which of these would you rather deal with? Thus says the Lord, choose what you will, either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemy overtakes you or three days of the sword of the Lord pestilence on the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. And, you know, when God said this to David, because David asked for a census that was not holy and God brought pestilence among the people of Israel. I, I, I think back to this and I go, man, what is worse? Three years of starving, watching all your, your family die or, three months of being raided and being brought the sword by your enemies, which is going to, that's going to encompass a lot of death, murder, rape, um, enslavement, burning down of everything, taking everything that you have, or three days of the sword of the Lord, which is absolute brimstone and sulfur and the angel, of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. I mean, like I would rather starve to death. I think before I see those <laughs> other two, I'll, I'll find a way. Uh, maybe the vegans are onto something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll find a way. Past I guess the, past the soy pudding. You know, um, Bill Gates and, and his uh, his new meat that he's making in a in a factory. Ugh. Right. Ugh. Yeah, be careful the chicken that you eat, ladies and gentlemen. Two of Gates' yeah. chicken have been approved. Um. Well, I ask that question because we are coming up upon the time where men's hearts are going to fail them. People's uh, faith is going to be tested. If we, if we do not right our wrongs, I mean, what do you think Joe Biden's going to do to this country and this economy? Look at how bad it's been in two years, three years. What happens the fourth year? My Lord, if he wins, what happens the fifth year? I mean, that dinosaur is not going to walk for too much longer. The Smithsonian's chasing after him right now already. So, They've got the embalmers ready on the <laughs> on, on on call. Yeah, you know, Frankenstein's monster is loose. Um, whoever comes next, and it's, I don't think it's going to be Trump, and I don't think Trump can stop what's coming, but whoever comes next. If it is not because we got down on our knees like Nineveh, we Mm. prayed and not just prayed. And I talked um, with Pastor David Lankford about this at nauseum. It's more than just praying for mercy. We have to stop committing evil in the sight of the Lord. We have to tear down the high places, destroy the altars. That means every Baphomet statue in Oklahoma has to be torn down and burned. That means every abortion clinic has to be torn down and burned. Every Masonic lodge, anything. And look, I know that there's, there's Freemasons who are listening to me right now. Okay. I'm, I'm not talking about the speck in your eye when there's a log in mine. Okay. Um, I'm just telling you that 
if it is not magnifying God, it has to be torn down if we are going to take God seriously. Because God takes our sins seriously. We don't take his punishment seriously. And then, for all of you who don't do that, then there'll be that one day, you know, when you get into the car wreck and you're flying upside down off the bridge and you start going, Lord, save me. Oh, hold, now you want, now you want me, huh? Remember all those times I've been whispering to you, nudging you, and you keep going back to sin. I told you I'd turn my face from you. You didn't believe me. You know, I, I came that close to one of those moments and it takes you now was that before you were saved or after uh before before it, i think it takes some of us getting that close to losing everything and to potentially losing your life or seeing your friends die and that's when you you go okay there's more to this than what i see and i swear i've talked from atheists to satanists um, to people who tell me, oh, I've been a Christian my entire life, Doug. I've never heard people talk about God the way you have. I'm like, have you not had an experience in your life, milk toast Christian? You know, I mean, but once again, you got to get outside your parameters of being comfortable and you have to get into the fight, which is right outside your doorway. It's every morning when you wake up, it's every night before you go to sleep. The war is going on while you're dreaming. You know, the war is going on with your children, with your spouse, at work, with your family, uh, with your friends. It's everywhere. It's all around us, and we ignore it all the time. And then when the physical manifestation of sins, which is God bringing judgment upon a land, comes, Jesus says, when I return, will there be faith left in the land? And I, I take, I've been, I've been ruminating on that. Uh, that scripture, I'm like, Lord, what do you mean? Will there be faith left? What yeah. what would happen to make people lose their faith? And I don't think aliens is it. I don't. I don't. I don't believe that. I don't think aliens is it because it there's not a representation of that in the Bible, where you know something comes from on high and it's like, ah, oh, here we are, your creators. Don't worry about God anymore. It's us now. That's throughout Old Testament and New Testament with the false gods. But we're talking about something. Jesus is talking about something way different because there's still in God, even in the people of Israel, the God had to humble his people. Right. Um, and I think America is being humbled now. You know, I think that olive branch is being stretched out to us now. But what is it that, John, do you think that could happen? That would make Jesus say, would there be any faith left? Would there be any flesh left? Where, where do, what does your mind go with that? It, you know, it's interesting because when you said that scripture, I, I don't know if I'd ever connected these two before, but um, it, it's funny. It's in the very same passage, if I, memory serves me, Second Corinthians, or sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, where uh where paul writes that that um that a falling away must occur first now most mo ne nearly all modern translations of a falling away uh that's the greek is apostasia and um th that our english word apostasy is based on apostasia now so modern translations and, and the modern church would say, oh, well, that falling away is a, is a falling away from faith. And, and, and Doug, I think what I find interesting, and let's keep in mind, this is all in the context, Doug, of God being uh, an adherent to free will. And I also believe fervently that he imposes that doctrine of free will onto Lucifer and his minions, where Yes, you can you can fall and you can become depraved and you can you know live your best life now, so to speak. Um, but you constantly make that choice that you're doing so. Um, so you have the choice uh, continuously until at some point he turns you over to a depraved mind and you're sort of you're you're so blind in your sin you you can't see anymore. But but back to the point, 
um, that falling away, I think is, is a corporate action away from faith, away from God, a diminishment, uh, you know, a diminishment down to a rem- remnant, right? A kind of a honing down to a nub <laughs> of, of the faithful. Uh, now, so, so I do think it, it, it doesn't necessarily represent a, a moment in time, a, a single action, but I think it, it, it represents a season, a long season of, more and more and more people turning away from faith. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that's, that's a depiction of this. That's a physical depiction every Sunday morning. You know, I live here in the South and, uh, you know, church used to be a pretty big deal. Um, when I first moved to our town, when we would drive Sunday mornings to our church, we would pass another big, uh, well, not another, but a, a United Methodist church, uh, kind of up the street and around the corner. And there used to be cars parked all over this main street in my hometown because that was Sunday parking for the big Methodist church. And everybody just understood it. And it was just lined with cars, like dozens of cars on the street and filling the parking lot and filling across the street, et cetera. Now, you know, we go to church Sunday morning. There isn't a single car on that street. And and to me, Doug, that's a physical embodiment of the falling away that has been occurring, is occurring in the season where less and less people believe in God, less and less people go to church. And when you look at the the survey statistics, there is this astounding, like a cliff-like drop-off of those uh, expressing a belief in God, or even self-described Christians who ascribe to a biblical worldview, which I, I can't even wrap my mind around that. How, how are you? A, of course, that was me once, right? But how are you a Christian? You don't believe the Bible, right? But anyway, I think if that falling away, if that trend just keeps occurring, it, you're going to, you whittle down to nothing. And, and, and it's so fast in this season that we're in that it's, it's breathtaking. Yeah. But what I, are your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I'm I'm here in Second Thessalonians. I'll read this real quick. The judgment at Christ's coming, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, mm. and to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So right there, um, the 27th, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians. Um, Chapter one, chapter, or, in? chapter chapter one, one, verse eleven. Wherefore we also pray for you that our God w- would count you worthy of this calling. Of what calling? You know, at, worthy of the calling to be counted to be amongst the saints. Man, that's a. You're asking more or less to be a knight in the court of the Lord. <laughs> that's that's. That's what you want to be. That's what I want to be. I want to be counted amongst the saints. I'll be happy as a brick mason laying the foundation of the road for you to walk on in heaven. Okay. I don't care. But the goal here as saints, we're, we are fighters. We're more than conquerors, but we're still conquerors. That, that scripture, I think sometimes gets twisted by men and their ego, but we are still conquerors. We are still to go out and to make disciples. 
we're still to go out and to fight the enemy. Have have you seen the movie Nefarious? I have not. Oh, it gives me goosebumps. Anyone who's watched it, if you've watched it, please comment. Um, it's a very good movie. It's made by the guys who made the movie uh, God's Not Dead 1 and 2. And the lead actor from Boondock Saints. Oh, I apologize. Saints. I, I have seen it. I have seen yeah, it. Yeah, the I, lead, I the lead actor from Boondock Saints plays yeah. a prisoner who is tormented by demons. Mm -hmm. And he's considered, he calls himself the Prince of the Most High. And that's his title. And he, he says that, you know, he's under Lucifer. The way that they wrote that character, uh, Nefarious, uh, the demon. The way they wrote how when, when God made the angels, it was just God and the angels. And then when God made man, they became jealous. Um, Lucifer started his falling, and then the angels who joined him uh, fell. And the way they wrote it was so compassionate, so believable about how much the fallen angels detest us because we are the apple of his eye and that we will, you know, actually be mightier than the angels eventually. Yep. And that we'll even judge angels. That's, that's such a, a strange thing to think of. <laughs> and when you hear the way they wrote it, because I mean, it, it was, there was power in this movie, man, I, I just recently watched it. And I was like, Oh my Lord. Um, the way the demon speaks about it, you know, it's like, we hate you. We hate everything about you. We're the yeah. reason why you go to the abortion clinics. We're the reason why you commit suicide. We start wars. We cause divorces. We cause adultery. We're the ones leading the pornography and the child sex trade at, uh, trafficking. We're the ones doing all this because we want you to destroy yourselves because we know it hurts the creator. And I was like, okay, the war is real. That is the spiritual war put in a context that I was like, man, that makes sense to me. You know, that really revenated with me. I was like, oh man, that now that really makes sense because I have dealt with prisoners and I've dealt with criminals who wanted nothing more than to torment their family because, oh, I was the apple of the eye. And then the new baby came and then no longer me. And then, you know, you end up meeting the prisoner who killed his entire family because, you know, he was jealous. Well, that's Satan and that's all of his fallen angels. And, and you think about the diabolical scheme of that, that character in that movie and how it is pronounced throughout the entire Bible um, that the spirit behind this wickedness is to make us destroy ourselves so that we can't be with him because he is a jealous God and wants us to be with him and we choose not to. And God can't play the game. God can't play the back and forth. You were sent a savior. You were sent the Bible to know every man in the world knows because everyone has a cell phone at this point, even the freaking cannibals out in the Congo, they got smartphones. They got Bibles out there. It's everywhere. The, yeah. you know, I mean, what every 10 years, there might be a, a new people found out in a forest. Well, those people eventually will be found and they will eventually be exposed to Christ. So I, at this point in time, I think everybody on the planet has been exposed to Jesus one way or yeah. the other, right? Has access to him one way or the other. And so I think we're in that point in time in prophecy. And so what comes next is a great falling away, is these huge battles, is the wars and rumors of wars, the pestilence, the famines, the earthquake in diverse places, the earth stumbling to and fro like a drunk man. And like, I try to put these things in my mind, like where are we at in scripture and how does it happen? Is it an event connected by a narrative? Is it an event connected by scripture where it's just going to go bang, 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 bang? Um, but who's in control of all of it? 
it is the enemy. It's the enemy all the time. And the enemy wants you to magnify everything but the Redeemer. And so, and so that's why I tell people there's nothing wrong with studying about giants. I'm part of an archaeological team out in, in Arkansas. What do you think we're out there trying to find? Freaking giants, right? I'm not being uh, hypocritical when I say this. What I'm trying to say is when the apple of your eye is no longer Christ, you're in the wrong. And that's what the enemy, the enemy will use members of the church, will use the clergy. They'll use everybody to get to you, to turn you away from Jesus. Jesus tells you, go and sin no more and follow me. Pick up your cross, follow me, go and sin no more. And instead, we go, oh, that's a nice looking cross. Oh, hey, look, sin. And, and that's the enemy. You know, it's, it's the stick and the carrot, the rabbit sitting on top of the tortoise. And that's why I just tell Christians, be careful with what you're doing, with what you're watching, with what you're viewing. John, that goes for you. That goes for me. None yeah. of us are uh, impervious to this. We're not Superman. So we have to be cognizant of the battle of the enemy because uh, the fight is real and iron sharpening iron like John and I do all the time. Um, this helps keep us in check. And this is what you, sh- you people should be doing this with each other. And if you don't have that person, pray to God, reach out that they will find God will find that person and bring them to you so that you can have that guy who will be there to, you know, keep you accountable, holding each other accountable. I don't see accountability in the church anymore. I see fallibility. I don't see accountability, John. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, what is, what is Peter right? He, um, Satan crouches at the door like a lion seeking whom he may devour, or I'm sorry, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking, seeking whom he may devour. Um, you know, and, and in this age, I mean, can you imagine back in the thirties or the fifties or the 1880s, you know, them, they couldn't imagine the technology, you know, that there's, there's more, (laughs) there's more human knowledge and experience in the hands of the primitives in the Congo in their smartphone than there ever was in the libraries of, you know, London or Versailles or uh, Alexandria right? absolutely, or right. Harvard. And, uh, and so, it, but along with that, the, uh, you know, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life is right there in your hands too. And so, you know, it would take us, I mean, you could pull up on your computer less than one minute. We could be in the most vile, depraved videos and images uh, that we could beyond our conception. And so there's never been an age of greater, uh, per, well, perversion, because I think we are as, as, and by the way, Doug, Doug was referencing for those folks listening, Doug was referencing several phrases from Christ's own words about what these last days would look like. Okay. And, and how we would know that we're in them. I would really encourage listeners go read Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. You can also read in Isaiah, I want to say it's chapter 26, where it talks about the the earth tumbling, uh, swaying to and fro like a drunkard. That's in Isaiah in the 20s. Read, read all the 20s, and you'll find it in there. You should read it anyway. But um, go read that. That's where it talks about the signs of the times. And in those passages, and the passages vary somewhat because they're different witnesses to these uh, sayings of Christ, and so they remember different things, present it complementary ways, not not um, conflicting, but complementary ways. Okay, because all Scripture holds together. Um, and in at various times, Jesus described this time as the days of Noah, and described these times as the days of Lot. The days of Noah were characterized by Nephilim, <laughs> so it's it's appropriate to understand the nature of that. And he described it where uh, all men's hearts were on evil continually. Okay, so it was a state of utter 
uh, depravity and so depraved that God said enough. And he, he drowned the whole world in a giant flood till there was, you know, Noah and his family in the ark and the animals. And then that the, the days of Lot, uh, it was, uh, Lot lived in Sodom and Sodom and Gomorrah were characterized by illicit activities that, uh, were of a prideful rainbow flag nature. And also it was characterized by uh, affluence and by uh, lots of leisure time, lots of time to get distracted, to get caught up in your pleasures, to get caught up in the, the fool's gold of the world. All, all that nuts, all that sparkles is not gold. Right. And so that was the days of lot. And so those were the characteristics of the age as prophesied foretold by Jesus himself and if you if you just you know pick up the 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 digital newspaper on your apple laptop whatever your smartphone and read the headlines that's what characterizes the age we find ourselves in today would you agree Doug absolutely absolutely and yeah you know before closing i would just say that you know we're all to be ministers in Jesus name we're, we're all to be out there making disciples, but I think what's going to be coming soon as I look out into the ether and I see this, I, I think what's going to be coming soon is new kinds of churches of the new age. They're already popping up. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're going to have like, you know, the seven sons of Sceva type churches. <laughs> they're, they're not even they're the, I don't even know if they'll have Bibles, but they'll be referencing, you know, hey, you know, Paul and the guy Jesus he talks about, well, in his name, we'll call out demons. Yeah, go perform that exorcist on a, a demoniac and tell me how that goes for you. The seven sons of Sceva were beaten naked and drug out of a house running and screaming and put fear in the entire village of people. But the Lord's name, Lord Jesus' name was, was exalted because of that so for us we have to have a care for studying scripture being willing not only to study scripture but to speak out against those who are not using scripture properly using compassion of course um because what is yelling at people ever help right mm -hmm. so you know using compassion and, and and understanding being true believers confessing to each other holding each other accountable, magnifying Christ, and staying focused on that thin, narrow road that leads to salvation. Other than that, the, the road to hell is wide and filled with pastors and reverends and clergymen and all different types of people who thought they were doing the right thing. No, oh, didn't our works lead us here, Lord? Uh-uh. No, oh, because you did it for you. You didn't do it for me. And there, there are, once again, there'll be people in the comment section who will take what we've, what we've talked about and they will, I, and I'm going to rebuke some of you right now who listen to me. I, I watched the conversations in the discord channel. I watched the conversations on the comment sections. It's half the reason why for almost six months, I turned off the comment sections because you people can't control yourselves. You bicker back and forth about ideologies and doctrines. And as, as the, the remnant, as the body of Christ, aren't we supposed to be here um, exalting Jesus, magnifying Christ, iron sharpening iron, and holding one another up? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? But instead, you're arguing about flat earth. You're arguing about, well, this doctrine and this theology, well, I believe this and I believe that, and you end up doing nothing more but dividing the body of Christ more and more. And you're doing that now while the power's on, while you can go down to McDonald's and get you a Big Mac and a big old caramel frappe. I know they're good. I love them too. <laughs> you can go down to Dollar General and pick you up a bag of Lucky Charms. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Milk's right on the next aisle. What are you going to do when your freaking city's on fire? What are you going to do when you wake up and you are in now 
Ukraine that is half out of power, half rubble, and you really depended upon the enemy to bring you diapers. I mean, I mean, I'm watching Russia bring diapers in. They're bringing um, stuff in for breastfeeding mothers, multivitamins. Um, they're bringing in antibiotics. Hey, praise God that they're doing that. The Americans haven't, have they? I'm pro-America all day long. The right America. Because currently we have the wrong America. And maybe the right America will never come back, John. But in my heart, I'll keep it alive. In your heart, you'll keep that alive. That's what makes America great is us. Us. Not anything else. But we who believe in the American dream, which I think is dying because we let we let the church die. Uh, we took Christ out of everything, and, and here we are, right? So, you know, just be careful. Times are getting weirder. Things are getting a little bit worse. Uh, the elections haven't even started yet, so the real fun hasn't started. Man, I wish I could work for DHS for just one more year because the riots are going to be awesome. Though that overtime is going to be sweet, boys. Soak it up while you can, because probably the lights will go out after that. In, in all reality, if the experts from the Pentagon are correct, we got a year, year and a half. You know, so that's why I take this more serious now than I ever have. John, I'll admit some to you. People ask me, does. Doug, what type of podcast do you listen to? I listen to other podcasts. What what guys do you follow? I don't follow anybody. I don't follow anybody. I don't well, listen. You follow to, somebody. Yeah, the Bible. His book is in front of you. Yep. I don't listen to other people's podcasts. I don't watch other people's DVDs. I don't. Uh, God had me shut off everything from everyone and focus on this. And my head cleared up. Imagine, imagine that. I'm going to give you the last, uh, let me see. We got three minutes left. Let me give you the last three minutes, buddy. All right. I, I would just exhort, I, I would turn back. Cause I, I think a lot of this has been edifying, hopefully for a lot of these, uh, young men who follow you, Doug, but I would just go back to early on what we talked about that. If you're well-founded, well-grounded, great. If you've, if you're grid is lit up because you are full of the Holy spirit and you've turned it over to Jesus and, and he's your Lord and savior. That's fantastic. I, and I say to you, brother, you know, pleasure to, to sharpen iron with Doug, with you here in the room. If that isn't you and, and you've, you've had a, an impotent view of Christ sort of put onto you without your real willing awareness or understanding. And, and you've always seen Jesus as sort of this weird, impotent God you didn't want, which is consistent with how Israel was, by the way. They they wanted the 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 line of Judah. They didn't want the the suffering servant. Uh, but the suffering servant had to come first so we could be saved, right? So anyway, if if that's you, I would just exhort you to open your eyes to ask the question, you know, is that really what Jesus was, who he was, who he is, or is he the most, the strongest, the most loving, the most uh, lovely warrior king you could ever imagine? The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, as Doug quoted. And that's the real Jesus. He had to come and lay down himself, which is the ultimate act of courage. He with with the entire power to turn himself over, he or, or to be saved, he laid down his life so we could be saved. So I would just exhort you to open your eyes, to dig into scripture, to seek God's face and the real Jesus, who is the the this omnipotent, extraordinary power that's available to you if you will repent and believe. And that, that's to me, I, I can't imagine a, a more important message, Doug, than than that for the young men following you. Yeah, man. I mean, this has been fun. We yeah, we should we should fun. probably do this more, John. <laughs> I would like that, Doug. Let's do that. 
Hey, do we say that every time? (laughs) I think we do. (laughs) And let people know where they can buy your book. Sure. It's johndislin.com. That's D-Y-S-L-I-N. And I'm sure Doug will put it in the show notes. And also Vindicta One is a discount. If you decide you want to get really equipped with like a full spectrum reference guide to complement your your Bible, by the way, um, we'd love for you to check out Nehemiah Strong. And I, I think you'll uh, you'll really like the the contents of it. It's very practical and sort of kinetic, but it's also very spiritually or oriented too. And so you get a nice mix of both of those. Absolutely. And the hand of God definitely helps you write that. You know, like I said, mm-hmm. I like to use it as a point of reference for my Bible because it helps bring my Bible to life and it helps, wow. you know, it helps give gravity to your words. Um, if you're reading material, that's not doing that. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to tell you don't read it, but you know, you may want to focus a little bit more on him with these days. That's my personal opinion. I'm sure that's John's personal opinion. I think that's Jesus's opinion, but, um, look guys, thanks for, thanks for listening to us. Please help support John Disselin and his, uh, his lovely ministry and what he's doing. Um, look guys, that's, that's all I got. I'm, I'm paying attention to the news the best I can right now. Doesn't seem like there's a lot going on. So, you know, don't, I will say this, don't forget. And Jamie Walden said this to me the other day, and and I think he's absolutely right. Go out and have fun. Go live your life. Yeah. Don't live underneath your prepper's spider hole rock with all your MREs and, and you know all your guns. Go out and enjoy life while you still can, while you're still young. Even for those of you up in the ages, long in the tooth, white in the beard, you're still young. Go out and enjoy life. Go see what you haven't seen before and you know while you're out there make sure to mention jesus a couple times so uh john buddy it's as usual it's great talking with you and uh, we'll try and get you on again soon ladies and gentlemen this is john disselin my name is doug thornton you've been listening to american vindicta stay frosty the enemy's out there Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum has said, you will own nothing and you will love it. And that's represented by what's going on across the planet today, where the economy of the world is in free fall. And nowhere is it more in evidence than with our own President Biden deliberately trying to sabotage what we have, access to food, other resources. So Americans are in a unique position, really for the first time in our history, we're going to have to provide for ourselves or subject ourselves to the whim of the government. Do you really trust a government to feed you that left a thousand Americans behind enemy lines in Afghanistan? I don't think so. So where do you go? When you ask the question, who's the best prepper out there today? There's only one answer. Ready-made resources and Robert Griswold. I call him King Prepper, and that's how a lot of people think of him. You have everything there you'd want from night vision to storable food how to prepare cooking in emergency situations books and videos on how to prepare alternative energy communication first aid that you wouldn't think of natural antibiotics you name it bob has it now here's the good thing about bob griswold that no one else does but him you don't have to buy anything to talk to him If you're not sure where to start with your preparation, no obligation phone call directly to Bob. You can talk to him for free. Most people will charge you an arm and a leg for a half hour conversation. That's not Bob Griswold. 
He cares about helping America get prepared. Go to readymaderesources.com or you can call the number directly at 800-627-3809. Again, that contact information, readymaderesources.com for the best prepping outfit in the country or call Bob Griswold directly, 800-627-3809.